This video is sponsored by War Thunder. Play War Thunder for free and get a premium aircraft tank or ship and a three day account upgrade as a bonus. It's available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. More on them in a bit. The final resting place of presidents, band leaders, war heroes, astronauts, inventors, civil rights leaders, Pulitzer Prize winners, boxers, Supreme Court justices, and sports stars, Arlington National Cemetery stands as a memorial to the melting pot of the United States. With connections to some of the nation's most influential people and pivotal events, its history is as interesting as its denizens. Arlington is located on 624 acres overlooking the Potomac River directly across from Washington, D.C. Although today it's surrounded by the nation's capital, at one time Arlington was a bucolic estate with a neoclassical mansion, Arlington House. Still presiding over the grounds today, that mansion was built by the George Washington's grandson and marks the beginning of the cemetery's history. Before she married George, Martha was married to Daniel Park Custis. After he died and she wed the father of the country, George adopted her two surviving children. The oldest, John Park Custis, died in 1781 while serving with the Revolutionary Army. He left behind four children, the youngest of which, George Washington Park Custis, was born only shortly before his father's death. G.W. Park Custis and one sister went to live with the Washingtons. When he became of age in 1802, he inherited wealth and property from his deceased father John, including the Arlington land. Hoping to build a home that could also serve as a memorial to his grandfather, George Washington, Park Custis hired an architect and built a Greek revival mansion, believed by some to be modeled after the Athenian temple of Hephaestus. The home was built in pieces, with the north wing being completed in 1802 and the south in 1804. These two stood as separate buildings until the central section connected them in 1818. During Park Custis's life, a portion of the mansion was reserved to store George Washington memorabilia, which included portraits, papers, and even the tent Washington used while in command at Yorktown. Park Custis and his family lived and died on the property where many of them were buried. In 1831, his only surviving child, Mary married Robert E. Lee, yes, that Lee. The Lees lived on the property with the Custises where they raised their seven children. At her father's death, Mary inherited Arlington. Robert E. Lee loved the property and once described it as the place where my attachments are more strongly placed than at any other place in the world. Prior to the Civil War, Lee had attended West Point, graduating second in his class and saw service for the U.S. in the Mexican War, 1846 to 1848. A respected and well-liked officer, Lee struggled with his decision to resign his commission of 36 years and signed with the Confederacy. Before he did, he was offered the position of head of the Union Army by Abraham Lincoln. Noteworthy here is that Lee was staunchly against secession in the first place, stating in a letter to G.W. Park Custis, As an American citizen, I take pride in my country, her prosperity and institutions, and would defend any state if her rights were invaded. But I can anticipate no greater calamity for the country than a dissolution of the Union. It would be an accumulation of all the evils we complain of, and I am willing to sacrifice everything but honor for its preservation. As for his own views on slavery, he was conflicted. For example, in 1856 he wrote, There are few, I believe, in this enlightened age who will not acknowledge that slavery as an institution is a moral and political evil. I think it is a greater evil to the white than to the colored race. While my feelings are strongly enlisted in behalf of the latter, my sympathies are more deeply engaged for the former. Further, unlike many slave owners, he also advocated for educating slaves. Of course, on the flip side, he was also a slave owner, denounced the immediate abolition of slavery, and was against giving even free black people the right to vote. He also felt that if the slaves were freed, it would be better for his native state if the freed individuals were removed from the region. In the end, Lee couldn't initially decide who to side within the conflict, and thus he seemed poised to choose to sit the war out completely. But upon seeking the advice of famed military commander Winfield Scott, Scott had one message for him. You cannot sit out the war. Not long after, he finally made his decision. Not so much to advocate for either side specifically, but rather for Virginia, stating, I shall never bear arms against the Union, but it may be necessary for me to carry a musket in the defense of my native state, Virginia, in which I shall not prove recreant to my duty. Thus, he turned down Lincoln's offer and shortly thereafter accepted not the command of the Confederate Army, but rather initially simply the command of the Virginian Army. The decision led his aforementioned mentor, Winfield Scott, to write to Lee, you have made the greatest mistake of your life. 
Going back to the family's lands in Arlington, its position on high ground overlooking the capital was critical to either the defense or defeat of D.C. Union leaders thus were eager to control it. After Virginia seceded in May 1861, Union troops crossed en masse into Virginia and soon took command of the estate. The grounds were quickly converted into a Union camp. By 1862, Congress had passed a law that imposed a tax on real property of insurrectionists. Mary was unable to pay the tax bill in person, and her proxy's attempt to satisfy the debt was rebuffed. As a result, tax was not paid, Uncle Sam seized Arlington, and at its auction, the federal government purchased the estate for $26,800, about $607,000 today, which was far below its market value. Not only a good bargain, Union leaders felt that by seizing the estates of prominent rebels, they would, in the words of General William T. Sherman, make them so sick of war that generations would pass away before they would again appeal to it. In 1863, after thousands of former slaves freed by the Emancipation Proclamation converged on D.C., a freedman's village was established on the estate, complete with new frame houses, schools, churches, and farmlands on which former slaves grew food for the Union war effort. As one contemporary journalist for the Washington Independent described it, one sees more than poetic justice in the fact that its rich lands, so long the domain of the great general of the rebellion, now afford labor and support to hundreds of enfranchised slaves. As Union casualties began to mount in the spring of 1864, General Meigs suggested burying some of the dead at Arlington. The first, on May 13, 1864, was Private William Christman, a poor soldier whose family could not afford the cost of a burial. Soon many other indigent soldiers were laid to rest on Arlington's grounds near the Slave and Freedman Cemetery that had already been established. Realizing the efficacy of the system, General Meigs urged Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, I recommend that the land surrounding Arlington Mansion be appropriated as a national military cemetery to be properly enclosed, laid out, and carefully preserved for that purpose. Serving the dual goals of paying homage to the dead and as a further jab at the Lees, Meigs had prominent Union officers buried near Mrs. Lee's garden. He also placed a mass grave of over 2,000 unknown soldiers topped with a raised sarcophagus close to the house. After the war, the Lees tried in vain to regain Arlington. Mary wrote to her friends that the graves are planted up to the very door without any regard to common decency. After Robert E. Lee's death in 1870, Mary petitioned Congress for the return of her family home, but this proposal was soundly defeated. Shortly after, other monuments and structures honoring the dead were erected, including numerous elaborate Gilded Age tombstones and the large red McClellan Gate at the entrance to the grounds. The family was not done, however, and in January 1879, following six days of trial, a jury determined that the requirement that Mary Lee had to pay the 1862 tax in person was unconstitutional. On appeal, the Supreme Court concurred so the property was once again in the hands of the Lee family. Rather than disinter the graves and move monuments, however, the federal government and Mary Lee's son, George Washington Custis Lee, agreed on a sale. On March 31, 1883, Uncle Sam purchased Arlington from the Lee family for $150,000, which is about $3.638 million today. And the rest, as they say, is history. And speaking of war, this video is brought to you by War Thunder. War Thunder is a realistic free-to-play military vehicle combat game. It's available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. No need to pay, you just download and play. In this game, there are over 1,500 historically accurate vehicles, all the way from the 1920s to the 1990s. They're all carefully built and incredibly detailed, and all the physics has been really sweated over. It's really very good, plus the sound, super immersive. And look, you could just jump in for a quick arcade game, which is useful if you don't have much time, or you can play realistic and go for the more challenging tactical stuff. Or for your hardcore folks, there's always Simulator, but yeah, I mean, that's just if you like getting beaten. So join us on the battlefield for free using the link below. Doing that supports this show, and you also get a free premium tank, ship, or aircraft, and three days of premium time as a bonus for registering. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of the American Civil War, ever wonder what happened to Confederate President Jefferson Davis after the war? Or want to know more? Even with a surrender signed and the Civil War effectively over, Davis didn't want to admit defeat. He set up a temporary government in Danville with his trusted advisors, John H. Regan, Judah P. Benjamin, John Brackenridge, and Burton Harrison among them, to try to figure out a way to reinforce their troops and push the fighting further west. Privately, he began to make plans to flee abroad to a sympathetic Britain or France, thinking that he could form a government in exile. But it was not to be. On April the 15th, President Lincoln was assassinated, now President, 
President Andrew Johnson was under the false assumption that Davis and his cohorts had been directly involved in the murder of the president. Union troops with the U.S. War Department's $100,000 bounty, about $1.6 million today on Davis motivating them, moved towards Danville. Davis and company retreated even further south. They ended up in the town of Washington in Wilkes County, Georgia. On May the 4th, Davis held what would be the Confederacy's final cabinet meeting in Washington's State of Georgia Bank Building. Davis authorized payments from the Treasury to his officials and left the rest in the care of Captain Clark in Washington, where the money promptly just disappeared. Davis, with his family, had been traveling throughout Georgia when they finally made camp in Irwinville in central Georgia on May the 9th. The next morning, they were awakened by gunshots. The 1st Wisconsin and 4th Michigan Cavalries had caught up to them. There are several different interpretations of what happens in those final moments of freedom for Jefferson Davis. While attempting to flee, the northern press wrote that he was wearing his wife's shawl and or petticoat in an attempt to trick his captors. He was called a coward, and later a popular song of the era was entitled Jeff in Petticoats. Davis's wife insisted, backed up by other historical accounts, that he was simply wearing a shawl because he had become quite ill over the last few days and she had given it to him to keep him warm. Either way, there was no escape. Jefferson Davis officially became a prisoner of the United States government. He was transported to Fort Monroe in Virginia, where he was held for two years as a military prisoner. Soldiers watched him 24-7 to ensure that he didn't try to escape, that he ate, and didn't try to commit suicide. The country debated how to handle the most famous war criminal from the Civil War. At first, President Johnson wanted to prosecute Davis as a co-conspirator in the assassination of President Lincoln. However, as the trial for the true assassination conspirators wound down in late June 1865, it became clear that Jefferson Davis had no direct connection to the parties. Within a year, Davis was transported to much better quarters and his wife was even allowed to move to Fort Monroe to be near him. According to the Virginia Foundation of Humanities, Davis respected the way he was being treated by the government. He was afforded certain privileges, like visitors, exercise, and time with his wife. These were all things they didn't necessarily have to give him. On May 13, 1867, he was released into civilian custody on $100,000 bail. The editor of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, abolitionist Jarrett Smith, and several other prominent Northerners paid that bail. Said Smith on his reasoning for doing this, My first reason for signing the bond was that Mr. Davis was entitled either to his trial or to his liberty. That the prisoner should have a speedy trial is a general proposition which no one combats. There may have been sufficient reasons for unusual delay in trying Mr. Davis. Hardly, however, for a delay of two years. President Andrew Johnson's own impeachment trial delayed any motions even further. Additionally, there were several issues that the prosecution, the U.S. government, ran into charging Davis with treason. For one, the defendant, Davis, demanded a trial which forced the government to figure out the correct way to prove the unconstitutionality of secession. Needless to say, this was a tough task, and the government asked for more time to gather their argument. Finally, in December 1868, a year and a half after he was released on bail, preliminary motions were held for Davis on the charges of treason against the United States for organizing and arming the 1864 military invasions of Maryland and the District of Columbia. The defense immediately called for a dismissal of the charges. They said that since Davis would already be punished by the 14th Amendment, he could not be further prosecuted under the double jeopardy provision. The 14th Amendment had only been passed in July of that year and dealt with a lot of issues in regard to Reconstruction, but in Section 3 it read, No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. The case went to the Supreme Court, but it was never tried. For fear that the Supreme Court would rule in favor of the defense and make the U.S. government look incompetent, President Johnson issued a pardon on Christmas Day 1868 to all persons who participated in the rebellion. Jefferson Davis was no longer a wanted man. Davis and his family traveled to Europe for a time after his release. Upon returning, he took up residence in Tennessee. He kept to himself and didn't comment publicly about Reconstruction. Privately, according to William Cooper's biography on Davis, he thought of African Americans as inferior to white men and resented that the South was ruled by, to quote, Yankees and Negro. He moved to an estate called Beauvoir near Biloxi, Mississippi. In fact, the state of Mississippi tried to make him a U.S. senator, only for him to be denied due to the previously discussed 14th Amendment. 
As his quiet retirement continued, he completed a two-volume book in 1881 about his wartime experiences called The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. In 1888, his reputation as a Confederate hero restored, he said this to an audience of supporters in Mississippi. Lay aside all rancor, all bitter sectional feeling, and make your places in the ranks of those who will bring about a consummation devoutly to be wished, a reunited country. On December 6, 1889, Jefferson Davis passed away in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was buried there for four years until 1893, when he was relocated to Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. His remains are still there, in the same city where his fall began. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor, War Thunder, link below. And thank you for watching.